What does it mean to come into the land of milk and honey? That's what we're going to talk about today. We have neglected the truth that a good farmer is a craftsman of the highest order and a kind of artist, Wendell Berry. Today, we're going to continue our conversation about the book by Margaret Feinberg, Scouting the Divine, Searching for God in Wine, Wool, and Wild Honey. We talked about it last week. I just enjoyed reading this book. So many of these books I read both for any of my podcasts. I sometimes have reactions like, oh, I learned a lot this time. Or sometimes I read a book and I go, oh, I don't agree with that at all. This one, I learned a lot. But I also just sort of melted into the book. I really just loved how she wrote this book, what she thought about this book, what the farmers she talked to discussed their farms and that connection God has and how certain parables and phrases mean to them who have that experience of being in farms. In the time of the Bible, Agriculture would have been one step outside your front door. Even if you weren't a farmer, you knew everyone else was a farmer. And now we're very much removed from our agricultural roots. We're removed from people who farm. And I remember when I got my new job and I was talking about this town that this new job is in, I said, boy, you know, it's a nice town. And she says, you know, in the end, it's just a big cow town. You know what? I love cow towns because I have my heart with those people who really do the things in our lives that make the most difference. And that means farming as part of that. So tying this farm, these pieces to the Bible and telling us what it means from their point of view, I thought it was just great. This part of the book talks about honey. And there are many mentions of honey in the Bible because it's sweet. But not only is it sweet, it serves purpose. And so she said that there's nearly two dozen references in the Old Testament describing the promised land as flowing with milk and honey. And she says it was first mentioned in Moses when talking with God at the burning bush. And then David talked, too, about surviving in the wilderness after hiding from Saul that there was Jeroboam's wife that takes cakes and a jar of honey. So it's the sweetness of life. It's rich in life. And Beekeeping is a very old profession and even existed at the time of David. It wasn't just by luck you came across a bunch of honey. People have been cultivating honey for so many years. Initially, people thought that the honey that they were talking about was a product from figs and dates. However, archaeology found out that beekeeping is an ancient process. At times in the Old Testament, honey is mentioned as part of gifts expensive gifts like spices. And you could see that honey was something very special. So when God brings his people out of Egypt and promises the land of milk and honey, the promise is is to say that this is going to be a land of richness, you know, that you'll have honey and sweetness, a land that will produce for you. I think in my mind that when you know you have bees, you have honey. But when you know you have bees, you have crops. You get pollination. And so the honey implies that there's going to be more than just the honey. There is going to be the ability to grow and produce food for your own people. And God was generous, she said, to the people of Israel and gave them food. The interesting thing is, as I was doing another Bible study that's not my own, is that someone was talking about how when the people of Israel got to the promised land, They saw all the food was there waiting for them, growing in the ground. And the day after they got there, the manna stopped because now they can eat off the ground itself. Also, when you're talking about milk, we won't talk too much about it. But the idea is that milk is also something of abundance, a richness in life. When you have milk, you can make many things with it or, again, just drink it. My experience in Israel is that while there were some cows, most of the milk was goat's milk, at least what I saw in some of the stores. But either way, milk is something very beneficial too. But the interesting thing about honey, and we see it now today, is that it has some antibacterial properties. It can be used when you're in trouble (laughs) to put on a scrape, on a burn. I know I use it when I went out training and my throat would get sore. 
the honey would help my throat heal. Or if you're sick and coughing, the honey can help your throat. It also has that pollen in it built into it. So they believe that it can help prevent allergies from occurring. We see throughout the Bible that Isaiah says that the promised child, Emmanuel, God with us, we hear about that in Matthew, that Jesus is God with us, will eat curds and honey. When we see throughout all the kings and the bad kings, honey is used as a promise that you will be able to survive on this kind of food because it is so, again, so rich. It's rich in calories too, and it can help you. Piece of bread and some honey, that's pretty good eating. When we also talk about the honey, we talk about the sweetness of life. We talked in, we talked in the past podcast about Passover and how Passover had that sweetness of life, horosis. And again, that was going to be nuts, a little bit of wine, some chopped up apple, but also honey. The sweetness of life is embedded in that imagery of honey. The last type of farmer that she talks to is talking about the wine farmer, the vinter. Because the vinter, the wine farmer, is the person who raises the grapes. And that is a whole other specialty. You could be a fruit raiser and make wines out of lots of things. But the person who grows fruits to make wine has to do a lot of different things. I come from an area that has some wine producing. And you can go out to these wine places. And the most intriguing thing is to talk to them about how they make their wine. They got the red wines and the white wines and the ports and their description of what they have to do to keep their fields from getting diseased. One of the wine growers I visited will grow rose bushes on the edge because roses are very affected by things. And so if you see your roses are flagging, your wine grapes are about to go next. Very, very clever. But wine is mentioned throughout the entire Old and New Testament. And again, it's another sweetness of life kind of thing. It is, it is made to make our life better and richer. The wine growers in the Bible are all the way back through the Old Testament. We see wine vineyards mentioned all the way back to Mount Carmel. Isaiah mentions Israel as God's vineyard. So we'll see then when Jesus comes and talking about harvest and wine, some of it has to do with the land of Israel. Some of it has to do with the leadership of Israel, but wine is often seen. And the other thing that you'll see in the Bible too is that Jeremiah puts that estrangement from God is like wrecking the wine. Yet I planted you a choice vine, a completely faithful seed, and yet you have turned yourself before me into degenerate shoots of a foreign vine. So when we see these wine references, we see different analogies to thorny vines. A lot of times those can be grapes. When I was out hiking, even in the middle of nowhere, I was using an app called iNaturalist and found out that one of the plants I was looking at was actually a grapevine, but it's a wild grapevine. It was full of thorns and it was not something you could produce into wine. You can see Jesus talking about, I'm planting the best vine and you have turned this into a foreign or wrecked vine of fruit that can't produce wine. And vineyards, many of the parables of Jesus we talked about in the Bible in small steps have to do with wine, about a wine grower who produced this wine press and it was very large and impressive and the people were going to be able to use in the parable this material to produce the best wine. And instead, they couldn't get over their pettiness to kill the son of the vineyard owner. It's all leading up. And because, again, they felt the agricultural touch, they understood building a fruit farm is one thing, but building a vineyard with all that goes through it to produce the wine is a huge investment. He uses one imagery of the massive vineyard that he produces and gives to the tenants and his tenants kill the son meaning the people of Israel will kill the son of God. And then the other imagery that comes in is there's a vineyard and there's two sons. The one son who says, I'm not going to work on the farm and does anyway. And the other son who says, oh yeah, sure, I'll work on the vine. And he doesn't. Which one does the will of God? It's the one who actually does the work. And so again, 
We talked about it in the last episode that fathers and sons and children and everyone on the farm is meant to work this vineyard. This is hard work. It needs a lot of effort in it. You have someone on the farm that's either not doing the work and not helping out. It's a huge loss. If you had someone working on your vineyard and they were making bad choices and picking the wrong item to prune, you can't get that back. And so now you're going to start struggling because bad choices were made, because bad work is being done. It takes everybody to do this. And so you can't just skip a day. If your grapes are ready to be harvested, they have to get harvested. So it is about the effort, too, of the people, our involvement in the vineyard to make the wine. And same thing with our ministry of the gospel. Our involvement is needed. The harvesters are called to be a part of God's farm. And then she mentions, too, that there's the last parable that talks about the wine getting put into old wineskins. And to us, most of us, that's confusing. One, we don't use wineskins, I think, anymore or at least around where I live. But what would that mean? And what happens is, is that when you have a new wineskin, it's going to be made of leather and it's going to be stretchy because it's never been used before and it's going to be able to stretch when the wine starts to ferment. But if you have an old wineskin or an aging wineskin, it starts to get hard and brittle as it gets exposed to the liquid and it ages. And as soon as the wine starts to expand, it's going to burst out of that limited wineskin. And he is saying, you are following practices that are brittle, that you won't let go of, that are old. And my kingdom is going to bring new wine. And unless you can stretch and grow with this new wine, you're not going to be able to grow with it. You will start to crack and break. Confusing, I think, to us. But we understand later that Jesus is telling people have to have room to grow in this new experience with Jesus. And then, of course, Jesus talks a great deal about how the vine is supposed to bear fruit. The fig is supposed to bear fruit. The tree is supposed to bear fruit. All of these, all of these farms are supposed to bear fruit. And you can tell what kind of tree it is, what kind of wheat it is, what kind of plant it is by the fruit it bears. And in the end, he's telling to us that people can't see your heart, but as soon as you start to produce fruit, and that is when we know what kind of vine you are by the fruit you start producing. And that means too, you know, we talk about weeds and bad grapes, but there's also just not fantastic grapes. You might have planted the same seed all across. You have this one variety of grape and you're planting it everywhere. But that tree right there, it took off. It started growing. It is healthy. It is producing fruit. The one next to it, it never really did much. It never prospered. It never grew in the vine or it never grew maybe in its faith. It's not strong enough, even though it's the same type of grape that is planted throughout the entire grove. This one particular plant is not producing fruit. Jesus talks about the producing fruit all the time. She said that, and then she read John 15, 4, as the branch cannot bear fruit itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. You know, when you're part of a branch, you're part of a tree, you're part of a vine, if you get cut off from the main plant, you won't grow. You just wither up and die. Most pastors sort of talk about it as getting cut off from your power supply. You know, if you have plugs in your house and you unplug a device, the device can no longer live its purpose because it's been cut off from the power supply. And it does nothing. When you get cut off from the root of God, you lose your nutrients, you lose the w- everything that you get from the main plant, and you shrivel up and die too. That is how separating yourself from God exists. That, that's what happens to you too. And I understand the frustration. Oh, I'm sick of the church. I'm sick of this. I I, I don't even want to be a part of this anymore because look at all their sins. And they decide they're going to cut themselves off from the vine and just go live their own good life. I'm going to live my life. I'm going to be a good human being. I'm going to do my own thing. And you know what? It never lives up to that because once 
you're cut off from the supply, the energy source, the the tree of God. It doesn't get easier. <laughs> you think it's going to be easier because you're away from all those horrible people that are screwing things up, but instead you're just making it harder on yourself. She talks about how Jesus has the wine, which is part of the Passover meal, but then probably that fourth cup, which is the cup of Thanksgiving, Jesus says, I'm not going to drink any more of this fruit of the vine until the day I drink it new in my father's kingdom. That's going to be the time where he's going to make that final fourth cup of Passover wine in gratitude that he says then, I will take you as my own people. That last celebration we're going to have together. She also brings it back. Of course, when we think of Passover, we think of communion and the wine and the bread at communion, bringing us closer in that relationship with God. This is a gift from him to us and be communed with not only our fellow brothers and sisters in the church, we are all kneeling before God as not the same people, but as sinners, but as loved human beings. Every single one of us is loved by us. And when we sit in communion, we are saying together as same beings, we want to join you, God, in communion. And we should do this in remembrance of him. So again, she sums up the book then, and she reflects on her time with the wine, the honey, the fruit, and the sheep, and all the things that God produces in these images of farming and how it's not just parables of some esoteric thing. These are tangible, understandable stories that God tells in the Old Testament. Jesus tells us in his parables so that we can better understand his mission, what's going on in the world, and what's going to happen in the world to come. Talks about the parables, I think, as I'm reading through these, and Jesus talks about how he talks in parables because people won't get it. But it's not because he's telling a story you cannot get. It's because he's asking us to take a deep dive into this, not try to determine every Well, the bird represents the sin of the Pharisee. You know, not like that. Dig in, understand this story. Get what I mean here. It's not that deep of dive, but people are either going to be lazy about it or they're going to be convicted against the words of Jesus. And I don't want to read your words into it. I don't want to understand what you're talking about. I have no idea what you're talking about, and I'm not going to spend any effort into it. But instead, through his parables, mostly involving agriculture, he is telling people, you can get this. You get where this is coming from. And so she says her heart fills with gratitude of all these people, these experiences, and how she got to learn more about them. It warmed my heart too. So I hope you enjoy this book. So my challenge to you is think about all the different pieces of agriculture on your plate and how does that connect us to God and his worship? How many things are on your plate that are mentioned in the Bible? Maybe not specifically, but you get meat as lamb, the fruit, the honey, the wine, and think about how God tries to talk to us in a way we understand. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. If you could please write a review of this podcast, I would really appreciate it. It means a lot and it helps computers suggest this podcast to other people. So if you could write a review and let people know what you think of it, I'm not going to tell you what to think of it. You can write whatever star review you like, but please do so. I appreciate it. And please remember our walk through the harvest starts with small steps. 